Hello and welcome to today's Thinking About Selling Your Business. We are here to help you get your business fit for sale. And I have with me my partner, Sharon McLean, and from Worldgate Media and myself, Sigurd Akas from Sticky Big Marketing. Today, our panelist who's going to get all those tricky questions around what do I do? How do I set up my business for sale? What do I make sure I have in place? We have Gordon Sito here from the Kiras Consulting. Gordon has been in business in the executive and larger sales company world for over 25 years. He knows the ins and outs of finance around projects and has moved into his own business now he works both with higher end but also with the small to medium sized businesses. Gordon is experienced in all areas, particularly finance. He is coming from, a, um, from an accounting background and we are going to hear his, his workings around how to set up the business, how to take it serious when you're jumping into it first off, and what you want to do to be ready to sell your business, especially when you are at the baby boomer stage and you want to cash in for your retirement. I'm handing over to Sharon to ask Gordon some questions, and then we're going to get Gordon to give us a little bit more detail um, on what he's doing through those questions. Take it away, Sharon. Hey, thanks, Sigrid, and hello, welcome, Gordon Sito, to this um, video interview for selling your business. And uh, I really want to say this to you, Gordon, that you are the perfect guest for us this afternoon because of your experience moving from corporate life into small business. Um, and still, I will say that um, uh, your experience working in uh, operations at the corporate level up to 200 million dollar firms in an as an executive uh, for many many years and decades for, for sure um, what message do you have and does that translate at all to people in small business do we have anything to learn from you oh hello uh, Sharon thank you for the opportunity uh, yeah it's uh, it resonates very close to my heart um, that particular point um, I find that uh, not, not only you know, using my own story just there, but also uh, many of my colleagues and, and network people, um, they, they, they come out, do their uni degree, whatever, or get into business, get into the corporate world and transition from counting the paper clips to being the top of the tree um, over that course of time. So they learn a lot about things. They learn a lot about experiences. Um, they encounter in interesting people. And what, what, I, what I found through my corporate career particularly was that um, there are certain types of personalities that manifest themselves in those, those organisations. And they tend to be the same ones over and over again over the course of time. They don't necessarily have the same position, but they, those personalities appear. So what, what I learned through that, that journey was to able to recognise those personalities and then how to actually interact and deal with them if I had to. So that helped me then transition from the, the midstream to the, the top stream, so to speak. So that, that's a little bit of the story of how my colleagues, uh, whoever I've interacted with, come to that realisation and go, well, why, why can't I get beyond this point? Um, you know, I'm trying to transition from a corporate to my own business because people keep asking me. So I'm thinking, why don't I monetize that and get out? Um, what, what they don't really appreciate at that point is how much hard work it is to get into that next space. They, um, they have this, this dream of, oh, I'm going to just jump over the fence and all of a sudden I'll be counting the, you know, the, the money as it rolls in the door. Um, six months later they go, there's no money rolling in the door. What am I doing? <laughs> so so they, then they try and revert and go, oh, I'm going to need to find a job. I need to um, you know, generate some, some stable income. Yeah. That, that's about the time when the shock horror thing happens. And they go, hey, did I make a mistake? So that's, that's one of the questions that comes up a lot when, when I speak to organisations or people. They go, why is my dream looking like my nightmare? <laughs> so at that point, I said, well, 
how about we talk about what your dream was to start with? Mm. And, and I guess, Gordon, it's, uh, it's true that, uh, you know, the foundations often, I see that with particularly women in business, they have a fantastic uh, mm. experience or ex expertise mm. in an area. They jump in and, uh, and they haven't really got a foundation at the start. And which then, of course, does not um, help them when it comes to the point where they might not just even want to sell, but maybe have to sell. The mm. foundation is lacking. Yes, Sharon. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No. I, want to, I want to back up a little bit, Gordon, to uh, the types of personalities that you detected. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, how would you describe those personalities? Well, you have the you have the the, the god persona, so he or the she, witch? the god persona, <laughs> god. So they're the ones that can do no wrong. Everything has to be what they say and what they do, and they think they can just wave the magic wand and it all happens. They don't understand or really appreciate the consequences of their actions. Then we have mm -hmm. um, the 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 follower personality who has has. Plenty of talent, but doesn't want to be at the front of the queue. They prefer to have someone else. They're, they're very risk averse. They, um, they they prefer someone else to get shot first and then figure out how to dodge the bullets afterwards. If that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the uh, uh, the one who's the, um, the 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 social butterfly. So they they tend to want to be everybody's friend. They have you know something to say on every subject but it's all pretty shallow. Um, so they're, they're, they're quite insecure personalities in that way. So they just want to be, they just want to be front, of, front and center of everything and be involved, but not really have any responsibility. That makes sense. Um, the other, the, the fourth one is uh, the, the aspirational personality. So they, they have somewhere they want to go. They just don't know how to get there sometimes. So they're, they're trying left, right and centre options and finally they get to a point they think that there's someone else there that can help them and they are, sorry, I just turned it off. What did you say? You're describing four uh, uh, very well-known personalities, uh, Gordon, um, and once that I think that we see on the part of those individuals who really want to buy, who want to get into business life, as you're as you're pointing out. And so, what we have on a number of occasions is that we have want to sell their business, and many of them, of course, are uh, boomer of the boomer age. So, but yet they're not uh, ready for a transition. On the other side, we have people who want to buy or get into business. Uh, we talk about this a lot. They're, they're sitting in their desks in large organizations, large uh, corporations, and they dream about being their own boss. Um, and so what we're showing them and talking about is how and what they can look for in terms of how to assess uh, a business to buy. So rather than going through the, the agony of startup, which is what you've discussed here quite a bit, in business and uh, carry on in, the, in that fashion. So um, yeah, these personality traits are, are, are accurate. I, I feel comfortable that, they, that I've come across them and I'm sure Sigrid has as well. Um, and maybe what we can do that is use some of that information and go to one of your strengths, systems that we want to look for in small business and small businesses. You talk a lot about contracts and and uh, useful contracting um, and uh, again those systems that we want to see uh, developed for uh, a small business before they go into a cell. Can you talk about that, Gordon? Yes, sure, Sharon. Um, the, the, the first thing I would try and get anyone I'm talking to is, is to tell me what they actually think they're doing. Um, because I, I can't help them until they understand actually what they're doing. And I find it's, it's interesting in that they have this idea of what their business looks like. When, when, 
you ask the hard questions, they're actually sometimes not even in the business they think they're in, uh, which is a real evasion mm -hmm. in itself. So when we get to that point, I, I step What's back. an example of that, Gordon? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I had a, a, a particular uh, experience recently where the, um, the, the, the other party came in and, and showed us their product. Um, and after about 10 minutes of conversation, they realized that they had a much bigger business than just that product. Um, and they had IP, they had some unique elements that they could monetize. Um, their, their, their product was more than just locally um, viable. It was actually a globally viable product. Um, and that um, they had all the answers already in their, in their kit bag. They just didn't know what the question to ask. So, so the questions that we asked then helped them to read it on their thinking. So when we, when we finished the discussion about an hour later, they walked out and they said, they said to me, um, we came in with one thought. We're now, we've got, now got this whole head full of thoughts. We, we actually, our heads are spinning. We don't know really where we're going to go. So I said, all right, we'll take a chill pill, take some time, think about it, and then we'll have another conversation. So... Then, then you can streamline and start getting reality into into the context of the conversation. So that that that's what I find um, is the is the start point. And when when, when we get to that point, and they go, I uh, ask them if they do if they have a plan of any description. I don't ask them what type of plan. I just ask them if they have a plan. And most times they nod and say yes, we do. And then I, I say, well, can you show me your plan, please? And it they go between these two things. <laughs> so, well, that's a fantastic plan, but no one, <laughs> no, no, no one else can see it. No one else knows what it is. Only you do. So can you explain it to me in, in one minute or less? What, mm -hmm. what, is, what is your plan? And they cannot. So that, it, that's, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say that plan gets lost in between the two sides of the head there uh, yes. quite easily with disruptions and uh, you know hurdles coming up showing up it all gets uh, gets quite uh, yeah. yeah quite lost so so in my my opening comment about you know what that that question why why is my dream looking like my nightmare that's that's part of the reason that they actually don't have uh, you know a plan to benchmark whatever they're doing and they're doing exactly what you just mentioned, Secret. They get off into a tangent here or there and they, they see some other sparkly object over there and they go, oh, let's go and explore that one. Mm. And they, they forget about, um, unintentionally or most times, about what they're actually doing. And they're off, they're off on this other tangent and it goes pear-shaped and then they go, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Mm. <laughs> so they're in there the lack of the plan and the benchmarking of what they should be doing. So that, that's, that's how I, I get them from the, the fantasy or whatever they're smoking they shouldn't be, back to, back to feet on the ground <laughs> and say to them, all right, well, let, let's figure out exactly what you're into. Then we can do some, some benchmarking of the things that actually matter in that, in that picture. And then everything you do, everything you dream of, everything you're trying, you've got to ask the question, does it fit with what I planned in the first place? And if it doesn't, then why are you doing it? And, and that, that helps them then with sharpening their focus with where they're going. So the, night, the nightmare then starts evolving back to the dream. Sharon. All right, more examples of, of systems then. I, I, think, I think this is probably almost the, the identification of those assets are um, critical when it comes time to uh, packaging or getting a business ready. So let's carry on more on this on this line. All right. So we, with the system side. So so um, again, a mistake that a, a lot of and I include myself in this in this conversation that we make is we go out there and we think we need an accounting system, we need a you know a inventory system, we need this, we need that. We just go out and buy it or set it up without thinking of what we actually need to set up in the first place and why we why we think we need that piece of software, hardware, whatever it is, or that process. Um, so we develop all these things that we think are super wonderful and spot on. And then when we, when we actually come back to our plan, we, we suddenly realize that some of that, that capital investment doesn't actually align to what our plan is. 
So we've wasted the effort. So that, that's why I go back and say, well, let's define the, the plan of your of what you're trying to do strategic, your business and so forth. Then we can look at your model and go, all right, well, you, you think you've got an accounting system, but it's really just a, you know, number, uh, it's, it's a number cruncher. So does it add any value to your business? So let's look at maybe a enterprise reporting system instead, rather than just a, a satellite piece of software or whatever on its own. And, and by that, so, well, you have a central database of information, no matter what you do, it comes in, it goes out. So it would make sense to have that central database of information collating forever. Um, it's integral because it's one entry point, one exit point. But what you do with it before it goes in, what you do with it after it comes out, is, is going to be the, the success or otherwise of, of that integrity. So um, I try to get them to understand that if, if you have this integrated system around you, then you can create processes, procedures and so forth that align to that. Um, and you never have to worry about whether there's some problem with the way the system operates because it's setting, it's, it's already set up and aligned to what you do and it's scalable for the future. Um, so again, Gordon, yeah. um, excuse me, Gordon, uh, sorry. Uh, it sounds like uh, these are activities that a company or a business might do, of course, when they're setting up a business. Do you also recommend this to a business owner who is preparing to sell to switch halfway through or uh, when they're getting ready to sell to change their accounting systems? Potentially it can be that situation, Sharon. Um, this, when, I, when I say to them, all right, well, put yourself into the potential investor or buyer hat. What do they want to see? Because they, they've got money they want to put somewhere. Mm -hmm. But they want to know that the money's being used wisely and that they get a, a return for it. So if you don't have something that is able to report properly, you don't have something that, that captures information properly, you don't have, you don't have uh, um, you know, people there who can understand and interpret that information, whatever it is. So if you don't have standard operating procedures, uh, you don't have a HR policy and, and so forth. So, um, so it's... That, that, that's why the, the involvement from the idea is there, but the tool may not be the right one. Um, so depending on the size of your business, like, you know, we talk about accounting systems. When, when you start off, you don't have a lot of money. You, you get QuickBooks or you know, a lesser version of Myob or something like that. And then you, you might become a, you know, 10 times the size you are. And all of a sudden you realize that you've got a thousand transactions rather than a hundred and your system can't handle it. So then you have to evolve. So the, the fundamental um, requirements are there. It's just that, that that particular system doesn't have the capacity. So at that stage, then we say, all right, well, let's, let's work on evolving or migrating you to a more robust and, and higher capacity system that actually gives you room, not only to accommodate your existing business, but what you're looking at in the future. That will then help when you go to the market or, or put yourself out there and say, I want to sell my business. The investor or, or the buyer will look at it and go, the, the, these guys have really got their, their act together. They, they're well platformed. We don't have to spend any money in that space, really. We just have to understand what they're doing. It's got capacity to grow. You know, as, the, as the investor, well, we're happy to take it over now, but we want to turn it into a, a much bigger business and so forth, so we don't have to invest that, that money into that system or that process, it's already there. So it's, it's the difference between growth and scalable growth, I guess, um, in, in that context. So if you position everything for scalable growth, your investor or your buyer will be a lot more interested that the money that it's spending, they don't have to double that money to do other things inside it. So you're suggesting it's worthwhile the investment for the business owner to invest in that that uh, both uh, financially and resources into changing that financial model accounting system before they even put it up for sale. So that could probably uh, take a year or two preparation before they uh, before they get up for sale. Yep, absolutely, Sharon, and that's, that, that's that's some of the understanding of what you have versus what you need. Um, so they the have things you, you you collect by by default along the way. Um, because that's all you know. And when you get to that realization point that it's not quite what it needs to be, again, put yourself in the, in the investor or buyer's shoes. They'll look at it and go, well, there's, there's, there's problems with, with this thing that I don't want to resolve. Uh, I, I understand the business. So if they take over it, they go, well, I'm just going to have to throw all that out and start again. 
So if you've got the, 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 the background platform position to allow that investor or that buyer to, to go, hey, hang on a minute, I don't actually have to spend that much energy or resource in that space. I just have to know what it does. And then adapt my expertise mm -hmm. to my system. It's a lot more attractive. And, and you're right, it, the time the timeline could be for a year or two years. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, it takes time to prepare for that sale. It, Sacred talks a lot about uh, talking to uh, an accounting uh, professional to, uh, it, for example, in your office supply business, Sacred, um, you talk to an accountant to help you get the profit margins identified uh, uh, more closely for you so you could go forward and quantify those. Um, can you explain that scenario for our, for our listeners? Well, well I, I, would, I would jump in here, uh, uh, Gordon, and say, look, the financial side is hugely important. That foundation needs to be laid for every business. And, uh, and I have had businesses uh, uh, with shop fronts, uh, and, they, and I would class them as uh, small businesses. So we had about six to eight employees. And particularly in the office supplies business that I had for a couple of years, the, uh, the, the component that was uh, uh, tricky was that the actual profit margins were just so tiny in that uh, industry. And you are competing, of course, with large size companies as well. And I, I found that uh, professionals like an accountant have some fantastic uh, uh, facts and figures around setting up and looking at, uh, at, at bringing up those margins. But I would um, definitely say to any business owner, that size that we were and larger, that your marketing department must be working hand in hand with your accounting so as to be able to really create um, you know, the return, if you are looking at increasing your, uh, your profit margins, you've got to have some ways of doing so. It's great to look at the figures and the facts there, but you need to now use tasks and activities to actually create that. And in the same way, my own experience with selling two businesses in the past that, that I have owned has been that marketing plays a huge component in setting it up. And absolutely, the figures have to be in place and your whole system needs to be systemized. Totally agree with you there, Gordon, absolutely. I, do, uh, I would add though, that that marketing component and working with uh, ways to not only have that set up, but then to help you work the system, you have to bring the money in. And that is where the marketing component comes in in a large way. So when you are, uh, you know, when you are looking at changing a, an accounting system, as you were just uh, sharing with us, that of course does bring the time frame into into much longer preparation time. So. Um, when, when a business is ready, uh, wanting to look at that, really what you are, what I'm hearing and, and, and correct me if I'm, if I misheard that you're saying that they really need a couple of years in a way to have a look before they want to, want to get ready. Um, is, is that correct? What, did I hear that right, Gordon? Not, not necessarily Sigrid. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, each case is assessed on its own merits. So yeah. sometimes when, when you look at what they've got versus what they need, mm -hmm the gap may not be that large sometimes. So the transition from the, 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 the perfect point, from the not so perfect point could be a lot shorter. It, it might, you know, as I said, it could, be, it could literally be a day almost. You turn around, you do assess it, and the next day you say, you're, 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 you're ready for sale. Right, right. You can go, well, you're a long way from that point because you don't have these things in place. So they all take time to transition. Um, yeah. And oftentimes it's, it's not that... The, the non-human part's easy. You just take the data, you manipulate it, whatever, and out, out comes whatever it is. It's trying to get the, the headspace of the people involved. Yeah. To be part of that journey, that's the hardest part. And particularly for the business owner and so forth, because they, you know, they've got an ego and they're, they're a bit arrogant and so forth for the right reasons. <laughs> that's what it will say too. But sometimes that's also a, a, their biggest hurdle to overcome. They've got to put the ego outside the door and walk in and say, hang on a minute, I, I'm actually, I, I've got to get down back onto the, the ground here. Yeah, yeah. So, 
conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that look, that's excellent. So my takeaway here, Gordon, is that definitely the, the financial foundation and the systems around that need to be in place. And that's what the business owner needs to have a look at and, uh, and, and set up. And depending on where they're at and what that gap actually is, depends on the time frame it takes. So when we are particularly here uh, supporting, let's say, well, particularly supporting um, baby boomer type, you know, age group uh, business owners that are sort of thinking about that, they should really start um, thinking, uh, what do I need to do? Because those sort of systems, particularly around the accounting area, are, as you said, for the buyer important. I would go further too, though, we have explored before, and I know this from my own business, that particularly the office supplies ones, the buyer was not so much interested in the figures, they were actually interested in adding what we had um, to their own business, which was in the same industry. So important was to get our list of our, our database into their, um, into their existing business and also the location. To them, that, was, that were two important um, factors to, to buy our business. They loved that. I mean, I had systems in place. They loved that because they could just jump in and run it as set out. But, um, but certainly um, for the average uh, baby boomer business owner, it's a good idea to start thinking now for whenever they want to have any and an, an, an yeah. tournament. Yeah. And, and it, it, it's, it's a bit of a cliche as well, Sigurd, thank you for that, um, where you, you need to know, and I think you've raised this in previous um, interviews before, where you need to know what the end looks like before you start. Mm, mm. And have some idea what that, that might be. So if you've got, uh, I'm going to be in whatever I'm doing for maybe three, five, ten, whatever number of years, um, then that, that's a strategy to, to point towards. So well, what do you want to look like in three, five, ten years' time? You know, what, what are you hoping to do? So that immediately then allows that, that structure and that rigor to come in into the planning to, to point towards that end goal. And if they want to exit at that point, um, the question I always say is, well, what does exit mean? Are you yes. talking about selling it off and never, never being in it again? Are you looking at retaining some sort of interest in it? Are you looking to work in it? What, what are you trying to do? And they, they sometimes don't have that answer either yet. They just think, yeah. oh, well, I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to make you know, mega millions and drink pina coladas on the beach in Hawaii or whatever it is. <laughs> we know that. And, and, and I say to them, well, how, how about you, you think about this? You can still have your pina coladas on the beach in Hawaii, but you can still be online and be, be involved in the business. How does that sound? Yeah. So that little hat comes on, they go, hadn't even thought about that. That'd be great. So I said, you're, you're exiting, but you still want to be involved. So you're an entrepreneur at heart. That's why you got into your own business. So your entrepreneurial spirit will never, will never go away. If you, if you exit this completely, you're going to turn your mind to doing something else and then you'll do that whole cycle again. Yeah. So if, if this is what your passion is and your love is, then, and, and we can get it to the, the shape and whatever that you're, you're more than happy with, yeah. then you may not actually want to exit in terms of leaving that's, for it. <laughs> you may still want exactly. to exit. That, that's exactly the story that we are hearing time and time again is that introspection from the time that they start thinking about uh, moving on from that uh, business. They, maybe they've run it all their lives mm -hmm. and uh, go deep into inside to determine what it is that they uh, see as their new vision for their life. And I'd like to just maybe move on to another topic, but is related within systems here, Gordon that I think you've touched on quite a bit with on your, within your career, and I'm interested to hear more, which is the forecasting models for revenue generations, and also, um, well, the, the, the revenue generation models that you have identified and that you've seen. Have you got a model that you recommend, or several models? And bearing in mind that we're talking to small business people here, uh, for them to quantify, or I guess to project where it is uh, and what, what it is that they can show to prospective buyer. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not one. Thank you, Shannon. I'm, I'm not one to say this is the, the panacea of, of your your question, meaning it's a, the, the, the answer to everything. So is that there's no shelf system that you can or process or model you can just buy and plug in and it does everything. 
there's always some sort of modification or, or you know, alignment to what your business actually does. So when it comes to forecasting or looking at the future, um, to, to be able to, to systemize that, I, I try and understand how they think they, they forecast or what, when they throw it, I say to them, well, what, what do you want to, what do you want this revenue picture to look like in 12 months time? So they pull out that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to have a 50% increase in our revenue. And I said, well, how did you come up with that number? <laughs> and they said, well, anecdotal evidence, whatever, all the things we've done in the past. So I said, right, okay. So can we go back to and look at some science and how we actually got from this point to that 50% uplift? So at the end of the day, if you're in the product business or whatever, it's you know, any, any revenue generation is a, is a component of product um, price and volume. So you've got a volume of services or products. When, when you price them, you've got to price them in a certain way and we can get them to at another time. But um, you've got to make sure that what, what you sell is at least a dollar more than what it costs you. <laughs> Otherwise, you're in the red. Um, so they come up with this and say, all right, well, how many services and how, you know, how much are we going to sell those for to get to this 50% uplift? And they tell me, I said, all right, now, now I've got an idea of how you, you came up with your, your magic figure. Let me now look at what system or process or model or whatever tool it is that I can use to help you. So it might be as simple as using an Excel model, you know, a spreadsheet model to, to, to map it out. And um, that may be sufficient for them to, to use for a period of time. But if they're looking at doubling, tripling, quadrupling, whatever their business, then the transactional volume becomes a lot more, a lot more um, significant. So where, where they started, they may have had two or three products. When they get bigger, they might have 10, 15, 20 products. So the tracking of it becomes a lot more labor intensive if you're on a spreadsheet, so to speak. So then we look at it and go, all right, well, what other forecasting and modeling tools are out there? And then we look at it and, um, um, I, I'm not going to name any particular product because I'm not spruiking <laughs> their thing, but I, I look at what the fit is and then I go and find it or, or ask you know, some of my colleagues, what tool can I source? Because this business is doing a thousand products in their business. They're tracking, you know, they do two or three or 400 transactions a day against those products. To forecast using the, the spreadsheet model is going to take a lot more effort and energy than it's worth. So how can we automate that? So we find out a, a system or, or a model out there that actually enables that to happen. Um, and th they're out there. Um, and mm -hmm. when you take yeah. away all the, all the froth and bubble from the salespeople, you actually come to a, you know, a working model. So um, well, well, the message I'm trying to get is understand what you want to do before you jump in and get this system or process or spend money on it. Um, so it's not, it doesn't matter where you are on your journey of your, of your business um, growth. You could be at the start, in the middle or towards the end. If you still don't have that, that tool in place, it, it tells me that you're spending a lot of energy trying to do something without the tools that you need to do it. And we try and get those tools in place to, to make life easier. So the, uh, you know, the, the time core business owner, I, when I do a little time and motion study with them, they say, well, we spend hours doing this forecasting every month and when you work it all out the hours is actually trying to track all the individual products on their on their spreadsheet model so you go well if we could have all those products plugged into a system and you just simply adjust the numbers and the price your your day or two days of that forecasting in a month might come down to half a day wouldn't that be wonderful and they go yes when do we do it <laughs> yes uh, Wouldn't that be wonderful? Sigrid, uh, maybe uh, this would be a good time to talk about uh, what uh, Sigrid and I have been doing is uh, offering a, a seven-step coaching program uh, where we want to help uh, businesses sell. We want to help them get fit for sale. And uh, maybe Sigrid, you could talk to some of the, the steps in, in that uh, coaching program that we have been uh, working with. Mm. Thanks, Sharon. Before I jump into that, I just want to make sure that uh, if there are any questions from our audience, the, uh, feel free to type them into the, uh, into the chat. Now you'll find the chat uh, down the bottom of the screen by hovering there. There's a little icon uh, to the right with three, three buttons, uh, three black dots there. 
and you can just simply click on that and then type in so we can ask the questions or we can open up the channel for you to actually ask the question live. Just wanted to throw that in. Thank you, Sharon. Yes, so Sharon and I have come together and as I just uh, touched on, uh, uh, Gordon, there, there are many elements in a business which you are fully aware of and, and are talking about and the, the marketing side of things is part of the growth and part of the sale of a business. And the way we look at that is uh, from our own experiences. Sharon and I have created seven steps. It's a system that takes the business owner through doing a complete market scan and industry research. And we are showing and helping the business owner there to have a look at what's actually happening in their industry out there in terms of competition, who else is up for sale in your industry, um, how are you, um, you know, perceived there in, in that uh, uh, level perhaps of, of where you are making sure, uh, you know, what returns possibly are. So there's a range of things that we get the business owner to look at in, in that step. Um, we move them to having a look at the potential buyer's profile. Now, when you're involving your business broker, which of course you, you probably want to, um, they often simply, like a real estate, will list the business. However, there's a lot more to it, a lot more depth to the buyer. And you touched on that already, Gordon, by talking about, um, you know, an investment or somebody looking at the figures of the business, what's the return going to be when they step into it. That is two areas. I we promote that there are more than those two areas that a business owner, uh, that, a, that a potential buyer might be looking at. And the, the seller, the, the owner of the business can actually look and create a real profile of a potential buyer and then take their own steps towards attracting them. Um, in my own businesses, as an example, I've just mentioned the office supplies one, um, they were looking to expand their own office supplies business by adding the location and the database. It wasn't about our figures so much. They loved that we had the systems in place and they just wanted to increase their own business by spreading into the area that we were in without having to compete but actually taking over what we had. So a buyer um, could have much different types of motivation to what you might actually think. So we're taking, um, we're taking uh, a business owners through that step we're then having a look at what needs to be prepared in that pre-sale uh, time frame. And you mentioned that, you know, uh, or Gordon mentioned that you need to have a look at your um, at your uh, figures there and, uh, and want to have a look at your system, your accounting systems. And of course, that's part of it. So what we're doing is we're looking at that with the business owner and then we're encouraging them to take steps there. So we're not the accountant, we are guiding them to take a look and then we say you need to talk to your accountant or you know whatever the professional is that needs to be um, spoken to in that area. But because we're coming from the outside looking in, which is always much easier to see what's actually happening when you yourself are looking um, you know, at your own business. And, uh, and we, we're making sure also that the top features of a business um, are seen by the business owner. So often a business owner, especially when they work day in, day out in their own business, and I'm sure this goes for your own business too, Gordon, you know, you're so um, working around whatever you see as being important because it's, it's the work you do and, uh, and uh, you're focusing on, on aspects that you think are important that may not be the main assets that actually a buyer might be looking at. So, Again, that's what we're looking at the, with the business owner in our program that we offer. Um, we then, as, as everything that we do from a marketing perspective, help the business owner to prepare their story. We all have a story. You've just shared your story with us, Gordon. Sharon has her story with, uh, with her own business that she was able to sell at the right time. And, and she can go into that in a moment just a little bit. And, and I have my story, I've already shared a little bit about that, but it's that story that needs to be written, recorded for the potential buyer 
so that they um, that they can on a, on an emotional level also connect with the business. Now that will vary depending on the size of the business, but there is that element of preparing a story that we that we uh, look through. Yeah. With, the, with the business owner as well and of course then you know the whole the business for sale uh, itself uh, a profile uh, you know what's there the facts and figures and so on and again we we are there to to get the business owner to look at that and know and and stimulate them as to what professionals what other professionals they need to involve and and get more detail from and then we look also in a big way at the um, exit communications strategy so it's not the exit strategy in terms of uh, figures and investment and that type but we're talking there more and what do you need to put in place to let everybody who needs to know about it needs to know and staff is always a big component when there's staff involved how do you handle that how do you communicate that so those are the seven steps we look at and we are very much looking at um, bringing that into place with other professionals we are saying look from the outside in that's what we do from a marketing perspective and therefore it's all about creating that big picture around it so we that takes that take we do that in seven weeks so mm -hmm. you know that's a that's a pretty good time frame to put all those preparations in place mm -hmm. and as i said we we like to make sure that we are engaging other professionals along the way or getting certainly the business owner to have their own if they're already working with professionals um mm -hmm. making sure that they do so yeah. So if I just want to say that again, um, if there are questions from our audience to please pop them into the chat box, we will address them immediately. Sharon, you want to just mention a little bit about your uh, as a business um, a sale, how you were able to tap into the right time, get the right money at the right time? Yeah. It, it, there was a moment um, in the world of uh, mass media, which is where I come from, I owned a, a magazine, a business magazine for 21 years. And um, this now goes back uh, 10 years ago now when uh, newspapers and magazines really around the world were, were going broke. And uh, because of the change up in the business model, which had all and everything to do with the internet, the, the uh, uh, arrival of uh, internet advertising and the transition, as well as it was tied into the big uh, economic crash that uh, resonated uh, from the United States in 2008-9, as everybody might recall. Uh, but there was a perfect storm that happened, and um, uh, media outlets were going uh, broke and going down. They were crashing uh, every single day. Um, and so I was really at the beginning of that, and as a small business uh, person, I was able to move uh, more quickly than I think some of the, the, the media mandarins um, who perhaps ignored that this crisis was on them. Uh, so I was able to sell that magazine um, to an individual who, who didn't want or care about the editorial necessarily of the magazine, but we were uh, producing some very significant special community events that that individual wanted to add to his stable. And so he really bought it for the special event that we produced, and one in particular, which had to do with recognition of, uh, of young entrepreneurs. And so that was another way, another, another method of, um, of uh, selling that particular small business. It wasn't for the entire company. It was for a segment of that company that the other buyer wanted. Um, so thank you very much for that, uh, Sigrid. And, and maybe now we can circle back to, to Gordon again. Um, Gordon, I'm so very interested in some of the work that you do around contract management. And um, I have seen uh, a, a number of companies here who have not got their agreements and or their contracts locked down when it comes time. Well, firstly, certainly for sale, because that's what we're here talking about. But just in general, they haven't got those contracts nailed down. What do you say about those? Um, your 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 money there, Sharon. Um, when 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 you're in business, you look at your suppliers, your people, and so forth. So every every one of those has a relationship to to you and your business in some way. So you, it, it's 
always smart to formalize that so that if it comes to a point where you have a debate that you don't want to have, there's no emotional <laughs> entanglement in, as to what, what your, your particular, you know, agreement is in that, in that situation. So if it's black and white, it says, if, if I do this, you do this. If you do that, I do this. If you don't do that, this is what I do and so forth. And it's all signed off and agreed. Then there's never an argument that it's not in context. So that, that when you look at the, across the, your, your business, you've got suppliers. So you need to have some sort of supplier arrangement in place with that particular supplier, whoever they might be. And it has to, be on mutually beneficial terms. So the terms of payment, the terms of supply, um, when I buy, when I don't buy, if, if I want something, you guarantee to, to give it or put it on my doorstep within a certain time frame. If you don't, then what are the consequences? So that, that's, that's one of the, the, the leakage areas for, for organisations where, particularly when it comes to cash flow, they, they go out and they go, well, I need all this product to be able to do what I need to do. So they go and spend the money because the supplier says, well, you've got to give me so much up front and then you've got to give me this much when I send the next bit and so forth. By the time it arrives on your doorstep and goes around the corner and gets re manipulated and goes ready for market, it will be three, four, five, six months down the road. So you, you've spent the money, but you've got nothing coming in. And then you go, you panic and you go, well, I've got no money, <laughs> but I've got all this product, but it's not here yet. So that, that then, you know, and if it doesn't arrive, then you're in a bigger quandary than, than when you started. So that supplier agreement is really important to have in place and it's, it's, a, you know, it's signed off, it's legally tested, etc. So all parties agree to it. So that's on the supplier side. In, inside the business, um, not, and this is also very important, between the owners themselves, they need to have an agreement about what their involvement in the business entails. So if they're equal partners, then what does that mean? Um, you know, if they, because this, leads to the exit point as well. If you exit then, if you're equal partners, what's the agreement between you two when it comes to an exit point? And if you, if you still don't, you don't have that clearly articulated, it can be a, a very um, unfortunate debate when it comes to that point. Um, particularly if the two parties are no longer friends <laughs> at that stage, we can have it. So that, that internal agreement between you two, it, it's almost like beginning to a marriage and having a prenup agreement. You, you, you know that if this happens, then this is what you do or this is what the, the outcome is. So it's the, it's the risk mitigation strategy in your mind about worst case scenario, I have the answer or an answer. So that's it between yourselves. And then you have the, the agreement between um, you and your employees, if you have employees. Again, that's, that needs to be very clear about why you've engaged those particular people, how you've engaged them, what, what you do if they don't perform, what do you do if they do perform, and so forth. So that has to be very clear as well. Um, so again, whoever is in that, the two parties completely understand what the, the pros and cons are of that agreement. So that's that one. And then there's another angle as well. There's, there's the subcontractor or contractor angle, because again, in small business, you don't necessarily have all the resources engaged inside your business, meaning employees. You, you have peaks and troughs in your organisation or your business. And at those stages, you may need extra arms and legs. And if you employ someone, you end up with an employee who you may have to unfortunately move on for whatever reasons if the business doesn't go as well as it, as it needs to. So then you turn your, your, your view to, well, let's engage a contractor or contractors. Now, that's another minefield of contractual agreement. So you know, just because a, um, a person has a, a, a business number or whatever, doesn't mean that they're a contractor in the true sense of being a contractor. Uh, you know, they can be deemed an employee or whatever by the ATO and, and you wear all those consequences when, when you have to put them off. So again, that, that independent or that contractor arrangement is, uh, is a really, really um, under, I guess, uh, almost forgotten area at times where you think, oh, they're going to be and they're fine. And then the, the, unfortunately the manure hits the fan, so to speak. And, and then you're in this battle that you don't want to be in. So try, you know, getting all those, those contractual agreements in place are fine. So, and then on the other hand, you as a supplier to a, another organization, um, you need to make sure that you're happy with the supplier, that relationship where you're the, you're the seller and they're the buyer. 
the terms, again, in reverse are, are mutually beneficial. So when you say you're going to do or, or supply something that you adhere to the times and, and, the, and the arrangements that, that you've agreed to, and if you don't, you know what the consequences are. So that, that's, that's all homework that has to be really nailed down tight. If you don't have those, when those sticky situations occur, the, the lawyers and whatever that get involved make all the money and you wonder where, else, where it's all gone. I think those are, those are such good uh, counsel, such good counsel, Gordon. Thank you very much. For small business, um, when it comes time to uh, contracts, very often um, they're afraid to actually ask for their, uh, those agreements to be solidified because they do not want to uh, disturb the apple cart. Maybe that if they ask the question, will you pay me on time? or what are our terms of payment, or what are our terms of invoicing, very often there's a, there's a fear attached to that um, that says, uh, you know, if we ask the question, uh, we may, the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the business client, let's say, um, will turn us down or not agree to the price that we ask for. There's some fear attached to that for the small business person, especially. Do you oh, see that? Oh, most definitely, Sharon. And uh, using Sigrid's example of being in the, you know, in the office supplies business, um, there there are a myriad of smaller uh, smaller businesses who aspire to be bigger businesses. So they need to make a decision at that point whether they're going to continue in their own business or become a supplier to another business. And in in the mm -hmm. context of saying there, um, particularly in the retail world, um, where you've got a product that looks sexy or whatever it is and it's attractive to the market and you do okay and then um, you know, some of the bigger players come into play who may be national international organizations and they come knocking on your door which is a great situation and they go we love your product we love your whatever it is um, we'd like to, to have that stocked on our on, you know in our shop fronts or in our shelf on our shelves and then you go wow that's really great i'm you know, jumping over the moon because one of these players has come to come knocking on your door the consequences of, of that decision to go into them um you don't really understand because you know you've gone from supplying a thousand products to a million products all of a sudden so yeah you know, what does that mean in terms of of that arrangement you have with that that, that particular um outlet they, they may want a thousand products a day and you have capacity to produce a thousand dollars a products a month so it, it's, it's not necessarily a good relationship to get into because they can cannibalize your, your, your whole business so badly that you're out of business before you're in it. Um, so the, the caution is there. And, and those, those big organizations, um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes they get a little, um, the, the personalities disappear. It becomes a very clinical transaction. They go, well, yeah. this, this, is, this is what we're prepared to offer. Like it all up, but that's it. So you as, a, as the, the, the other side go, do I really want to be in this? It, it, the, the dollar signs go up and saying, wow, I could, I could quadruple, you know, trillion times my business if I get into bed with them. But when you look harder at it, it may actually not be an opportunity you want to take up because you, you simply don't want to be in that space. It, it'll drive your emotions and, and your, your personality you know, into the dark side. <laughs> so, so at that point, then you go, wow. Well, that was the biggest mistake I ever made. I should never have gotten in bed with them. And then you segue back out and you go, well, I'll need to, and this is where the exit thinker, I'll sell it off to them and I'll start again. And I'll not make that mistake again. This all comes circles back again to really knowing about uh, your, your own life for yourself and your family and for your business transition. And so what my takeaway here is is that the, the days of the handshake are over uh yes. and maybe they never were in place but uh, the the handshake doesn't cut it that's for sure not today yeah and and, uh, and uh, i think a live example of that in the past is um you know, i i had someone and i can't mention who they are um they they had a business that that they inherited from you know from the family um developed it and, and, and got it to a point where it was a multi-million dollar business, um, doing really well, generating um, significant return on the bottom line as well as in their pockets. And then um, decided that, that, they, that he, want, he thought he wanted to play in a bigger space. 
And um, I, I said to him, well, why do you want to do that? You're already generating this amount of turnover, this amount of profit, this amount of money in your pocket. You're happy, you've, you know, you've got your boat, your house, whatever it is, you know, and so forth. So if you, if you want to get into that other space, you're looking at potentially doubling, tripling the size of your, your organisation in terms of turnover as well as structure. That comes with a lot of headaches that you don't even have yet. Um, and so you're not really a people person. So you're now going to have, instead of 10 people, you're going to have 30 people. How are you going to cope with that? <laughs> so so we, had, we had this yeah. conversation and, and we got to a point where, you know, to, to, to become, to double or triple your size, organically, you can't do that. You're going to have to look at acquisition or, or get into bed with someone else. Now, Good you know, advice. Gordon, we're, we're, we're closing in on our 60 minutes and we do promise to be on time, uh, both for yourselves and our viewers. Um, what single most important message do you want to leave with our viewers, uh, small business uh, viewers who are thinking about selling their business? Um, uh, understand what you know and don't pretend to know what you don't know. That pretty much summarizes it up really nice and <laughs> tight, doesn't it? I love it. Thank you, Gordon. That's excellent. Sharon, so, any... Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, on your point with, uh, with the marketing, and this is where the, the, the show, you know, don't, don't pretend that you have all the answers. Mar marketing is so important to the end game. And one, one of the things that, uh, again, I discuss with, with my clients is, you do understand that you are a brand as well, not just your business. So at the moment, yeah. they're kind of one and the same. They could be exactly the same. And somewhere along the line, they're going to separate, particularly if you sell off the business. So do you want you know, X Incorporated forever as your brand or do you want to be X Incorporated as the business and Y Incorporated as your brand? So it's just, you can monetize yourself as well. Mm. So and that's part of the journey. Very and that's good. It involving you know, people who are experts like yourselves in that in that discussion they go right oh well there's a reason why you're good at what you do there's a reason why you've got credibility when you stand up and speak to whoever it is that cares to listen and said so you're a brand so why don't we look at how to develop and 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 get some ip into your brand so that when you sell off you can do other things. You can be up there and be the public speaker and everyone will be go, yes, thank you, you know, <laughs> and bow to you. <laughs> so anyway, so that, I, I'll leave that as a thought that, um, that that's often forgotten and underestimated how much value they actually have within themselves. To, mm. to, you know, and, and you're right with the buyer, the buyer in mind. So you put yourself in the shoes of the buyer if you're a business seller and you go, well, what would, I want, what would a buyer want to see in my business to attract them to it? It's me or it's yes. my business. <laughs> very good all right so anyway so hopefully that answers your question Sharon. I think that's, it. that's a very good summation gordon and i think a very important message that we all of us want to get across to uh, those people who are thinking and planning plotting to sell their business um what is it that they're going to do after the transition and uh, their, um, their own information, uh, their own brand, part, uh, pardon me, is uh, something that they can translate into a new dream for themselves as well. Big yes. Absolutely, yes. and that is, uh, that is our uh, panel interview today with Gordon Seto from Dacres Consultant, uh, Consultants. He is uh, an expert in the financial area and really looks at systems and all of the details of having your finances in place. Thank you so much for those details. You are here and have listened today to, we're here to help you get your business fit for sale with um, systems and steps that can take as little as seven weeks to start with and we put you on the pass. Thank you so much and that's it for today.